I had this need of coming to America. I mean, when I started learning about America at the age of 10, and we, we got geography lessons and, and uh, learned about uh, America and about the, and so the first photographs I remember, and there's uh, photos in the textbook, but also in super eight millimeter film footage that they showed in the classroom, you know, about the Golden Gate Bridge and the Empire State Building and the, the six lane highways and all this. I said, what am I doing here in Austria? I mean, there's little roads. I want to go over there and I want to be part of the, the, the big deal. And uh, so I had always this desire and I felt like that the only way I ever would get to America, because in those days it wasn't common that you buy yourself a ticket that no one could afford that. So I had to kind of accomplish something big that takes me to America. And then when I, I read about this guy, Reg Park, who won Mr. Universe three times and then became a star in Hercules movies, and then was in Italy filming, and then in Hollywood filming, I felt that could be the ticket. I should become Mr. Universe, I should become kind of a second Reg Park. Of course, no one really bought into that. My parents thought I was totally insane. And um, I remember that uh, I, I hung up pictures above my bed, um, you know, for, for inspiration, uh, pictures of Reg Park in his posing trunks and all that. My mother was so concerned, she called the, the local doctor and she had him analyze the wall because she thought that uh, there's something terribly wrong that I have naked man above my bed <laughs> and all of my buddies had women hanging above their bed. And so she was concerned about that. And, uh, but they just, I think that uh, my parents really thought that there was something terribly wrong of being that driven. You know, because I would come home at lunchtime, and instead of having lunch, I would do 200 sit-ups. And at night, I would go to the stadium, and I would be lifting weights. I would come home at 10 o'clock at night, and I would be continually lifting weights. So it was like one of this insanity in the military. I would continue lifting weights. No matter how the training was and how tough the basic training was, I would always then lift weights afterwards. And as a tank driver, would have on the side of the tank in the toolbox, I would have my weights, my barbells, and my dumbbells, and my exercise bench and everything there in order to be, at any given time, if we stopped driving the tank and maneuvers at two in the morning, I would be able to pull out my weights and again lift for two hours my weights. So I was really a fanatic about the whole thing. But it's the only way you really get where uh, the way I, I succeeded because uh, uh, I became at the age of 20 the youngest Mr. Universe in London in the history of bodybuilding, because the, the youngest before then was Reg Park, the guy I was talking about, with the age of 24. But I became the youngest with 20, but it was because I was like so serious about the whole thing. And it worked. With the age of 21, after I won my second Mr. Universe title, uh, I got an invitation from Joe Weider, who was the publisher of all the muscle magazines in America, and also the person that had the biggest warehouses of weight training equipment and had food supplement companies and all this. And he brought me to America, and so there I was. I mean, six years after my dream started, I was in America. When I used to do seminars on how to become a champion, I uh, would always ask people, why do you want to be a champion? Or what do you want to accomplish? Why are you training? And they will, if, you, if a guy would get up and he would say, well, I want to train because I think that if I get muscular, and um, you know, I feel like I'm getting the kind of definition that I maybe can enter a bodybuilding competition. I said, sit down. I said, if you think this way, you're gonna be a loser. You're never gonna make it because there's no maybe. You got to get up and say, I wanna be a champion. And I do whatever it takes. The amount of hours it takes, the posing, the this, the that, the visualization, looking at training footage, looking at motivational books, reading this, reading, whatever it takes, I would do. That's the answer I want to hear from you. You can detect right away those that are going to be shaky and that will fall behind and they will not go all the way and those that are very hungry. And that hunger you have to develop because you have to create a goal for yourself, whatever that may be, a short-term goal and a long-term goal, and you got to go after that. And if you do not see it, and if you do not believe it, who else will? You are a fantastic direct response marketer with your mail order business. Can you talk well, just about the dollar into two concept? Well, it, it, you know, we all pay taxes. And we all hate the idea that we're losing that money. Mm. 
But there's a difference between uh, hating that you lose that money and hating to pay taxes. I love paying taxes. Mm -hmm. If it is the fair amount and if it is used wisely, I think we all have to contribute that because that's how you set up social programs, that's how you build infrastructure, that's how you have a military and all of those kind of things. So that, that's great. But I always had the belief that the money that I pay in taxes, I want to make up through wise investments. Mm -hmm. So this is why I got into real estate right away in the 70s <clears throat> and I started buying raw land um, and developing that, uh, started buying apartment buildings. And, uh, and, you know, just think about it. I mean, we in, in, I remember in 1974, I bought my first apartment building and uh, we bought it for $215,000. That's, it was then a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, I put only down like maybe $35,000, dollars But within two years, that apartment building was worth, instead of the two hundred fifteen, three hundred and fifty thousand mm dollars -hmm. and I sold it. So uh -huh. imagine now how much gain there was. Yeah. Right? I mean, so it, 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 we made hundreds of percent of, of my initial investment. Mm. So that's what I'm talking about. So it, it's, it takes, uh, you know, thoughts and uh, ideas can make much more money than actual physical labor. Mm -hmm. And physical labor is always part of the action because I always say you got to work your ass off no matter what you do because now you have a great idea but then you still have to implement it and you have to hustle, you have to go to the bank, get your financial statement, do this and that and they raise money sometimes and you go and look at a thousand apartment buildings to find the right one and all those kind of things. So you still have to work. But normally, if it is just physical labor, you can never make the money than you can make when you have ideas. So this is why it's important. I always tell people, I say, the secret is, is there's certain times, don't think. Like when you get up in the morning, don't think. Just roll out of bed, go in your life cycle, or go on a bicycle ride, or go to the gym, work out. You know that's what you have to do. And then read something and learn something. So mm -hmm. don't even think about it. Yeah. But there's other times where you have to really think and you really have to get creative and have a clear vision of where you want to go and what you want to do. And that's what I always had and that's what I always believed in. I always believed in making money so that then you can do something with that. You invest in it in orders, eventually you create a family, you give some of your kids and all that stuff, but also for charity. Yeah. Look, I have the, the, the Schwarzenegger Institute at USC. Yeah. And so we have to raise money all the time and make money to, 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 to pay for that and, those, and, and to support that. Yeah. We have the R20, the environmental organization. Well, any organization and any idea is great, but if you don't have the money, you can implement anything. Yeah. And so this is why it is important that if it's an environmental organization or if it is my after school programs, that are nationwide where we raise millions and millions of dollars every year or if it is just you know living in a great a great mansion or driving a nice Bentley in the Bugatti you know this kind of things it takes money to do all this kind of stuff so yeah. therefore I believe in making one dollar into two and having a good time when I pay my taxes so when <laughs> someone says you says Arnold I say we have bad news you, you, you owe 15 million dollars in taxes I say wow <laughs> yes <laughs> And then they look at me and say, why are you happy about He's that? He's finally said, lost because, it. <laughs> because that means we must have made a lot of money. Yeah. You have to pay that much money in taxes. And they say, yeah, that's the way I look at it. And so that's the way I look at it. Experiencing uh, pain in your muscles and aching and just then go on and go on and then go on. And this last two or three or four repetitions, that's what makes actually the muscle then grow. And that uh, divides then one from a champion and one from not being a champion. If you can go through this pain barrier, you make it to be a champion. If you can't go through, forget it. And that's what most people lack, is on this, having the guts, the guts to go in and just say, I go through and I don't care what happens. You know, it aches and if I fall down, I, I have no fear of fainting in a gym because I know it's, it, it, it could happen. I threw up many times while I was working out, but it doesn't matter because it's all worth it. Where you had an early meeting with Dino De Laurentiis and it didn't go so well. Well. That was different because Dino De Laurentiis had an office and he wanted me to be in Dark Savage. And he wanted me to play the villain in Dark Savage. And I walked in and I always kind of, you know, have a, a mouth that sometimes goes a little bit too fast. And uh, I step on uh, myself. Uh, it, it's, it's, I walked into the office and I saw Dino standing behind his desk. And it was this huge desk ornate with gold and kind of like French looking or Italian looking, I don't know what, but it was gigantic. It was one of those partner desks, right? And Dino 
the only thing that stood out was kind of his chest and his head because he's a little guy. Dina is a really short guy. So I looked, w- looked in, uh, I walked in his office and I looked in and I says, hi Dina, why does a little guy like you need such a big desk? <laughs> and to Dina the horrendous, you never say you're little, right? <laughs> because he saw himself as a giant. So he looked at me and he says, ah, a Schwarzenegger, you have an accent. I cannot use you. Ah. <laughs> and I said, again, stupidly, who is talking about having an accent? I mean, look, listen to you. <laughs> ah, oh, you are a Nazi. Ah, you know, and he walked away, he walked away because I had a German accent. So it, that was the end of that. So I left the office, and my agent came up to me, grabbed me, really forceful with my arm, and he said to me, he says, I have been an agent for 15 years. This meeting was exactly one minute and 14 seconds. It was the shortest meeting we've ever had. You just fucked everything up. God damn it, it took me months to get in here. So he was mad at me also. So anyway, so that's, so that's how the relationship started with Dino. But then when he bought Conan, he came to Spain where we were shooting, and the third day of filming, after he saw the dailies, uh, the footage that we have filmed, he came up to me and he said, Schwarzenegger, you are Conan. Ah. And he walked off. <laughs> and, uh, and Milius came to me, the director, and he says, this is the greatest compliment that he can ever get. He said, you're Conan. Isn't that great? And I said, yeah, I guess so. And from that point on, we created this really great relationship, and we did movies together, and uh, Raw Deal, and then uh, Red Sonia, and uh, Conan the Destroyer, and Conan the Barbarian. And, and, and uh, he was, became kind of like a father figure. He became kind of the Reg Park that they, I had in, in a bodybuilding world in Joe Weider. Uh, he became that character in the movie world that I could go to for anything, who would give me advice, who always had wonderful compliments and kind of took me in as part of his family. And so that's why I always will miss him very dearly after he passed away. In The Terminator, you have a very, very famous line, maybe your most famous line ever. Um, but you explained that when you were learning English, you didn't understand contractions. You hated them. So you thought the line should be said differently than it was written. So how would that line have sounded if you'd gotten your way? I will be back. <laughs> I was as wrong as anyone can be. <laughs> I was arguing with Jim Cameron. Um, Jim Cameron wrote the script. And so that's mistake number one. You never tell a writer that you want to change his lines. And uh, we had that battle. When we shot the scene, I said, look, I just think it sounds funny when I say, I'll be back. I'll, it's weird when, when I say that. And he said to me, he says, look, Arnold, let's shoot it 10 different ways. Let's not get hung up, should you say it or not, because you are going to say it. Because I wrote it. <laughs> and I don't tell you how to act, and you don't tell me how to write. So let's just move forward. Let's just shoot it 10 different ways. You know, so that's how Jim and I always talk, kind of straightforward. And, uh, and we shot it 10 different ways. Close-ups, medium shots, long shots, uh, zoom-in shots, and everything you can think of. And, um, and you know, by the time I did say it like 50 times, uh, with all the different takes and shots, it sounded right to me. It sounded strong to me because it, it, it just didn't feel like it was strong enough and machine-like enough. And uh, and uh, on the end, you know, when I saw it in the film, I was happy that he convinced me to, to say it that way. And uh, when you say a line like that, you never know if that's the line that becomes the most famous line in the movie history. And it just was voted as number one line in movie history. Um, you don't know that. I didn't even know it was any special at all. Only when I promoted the film, and I, I remember I was in New York, and I had people coming up to me on the street and saying to me, says, say it. <laughs> and I said, say what? They say, the line, the line from Terminator. And I said, which one? Oh, come on. <laughs> You know, I'll be back line. I said, okay, I'll be back. No, no, no. Just the way you say it in a movie. And then I would say, 
I'll be back. Yeah, 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 that's the one. Yeah. So I realized then, Jesus, what did we create, a monster there or something like that? It was like, well, it was like a big surprise to me that it became such a big hit. And it became bigger as time went on. And, um, you know, the rest is history. So.